Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, my name is Casey, and today I'm in Dubai Investment Park 2 in front of a company called Valid Designs. They're a custom fabrication shop, and I'm super excited because they're doing the custom drawer system on my F350 Super Duty behind me. Not only are they doing a custom drawer system, but they're also doing a full pull-out kitchen with Dometic sink and stove, around 200 liters of a stainless steel water tank, and a full 12-volt system with lithium and solar. Full disclosure, Valid Designs is not sponsoring this video in any way, shape, or form. They have not provided me any sort of a discount in exchange for this content. They've simply been kind enough to allow me behind the scenes to shoot the full process from start to finish and to share that with those of you that might be interested in doing a similar build of your own. So with that being said, let's jump right into it because I'm super excited to get this one-of-a-kind build started. I briefly sat down with the design team to finalize the drawer system design, and I was really surprised with the 3D rendering that they showed me. Seeing my design taken from a drawing on a piece of paper I provided them to a 3D scale is not only impressive, but it's extremely reassuring. After all, you can always envision something in your mind, but to see it in 3D space is really helpful. Personally, I believe the design phase is the most important step in the build process as it sets expectations as a customer and deliverables as a service provider. Maybe for small projects, it's not as important, but for complex projects of this magnitude, it's crucial. During this time, I ask as many questions as possible, such as material thicknesses, load ratings, how drawers attached to the slides, how the slides attach to the base, which parts are screwed down, which parts are welded, where bends are made, and where the electrical and plumbing and gas are routed. I do this so that myself and the design can identify any problem areas with the design that need to be addressed or where things can be improved. As honestly, once the design is finalized, I should not be asking after the panels have been cut and folded why something was done the way it was. Everybody should have the same understanding. So ultimately, we did make a few alterations on the design and what those alterations were and the reasons behind them, I'll save for another video where I dive deeper into the design of the build. But surprisingly, those alterations also led to quite a few improvements. We were able to achieve my target of 200 liters for the water tank, as well as space for propane tanks and the water filtration system. The design team also suggested adding a molly panel to the rear bulkhead to enclose all of those systems and improve the aesthetic look. And I have to agree, it really does tie everything together. I'm eager to see how this 3D rendering looks in person, so Andrew and I are gonna head over now to the laser cutter and start cutting. It's a little bit noisy in here, it is an active workshop, so apologies for that. We'll try to make up for as much as we can, but uh, we just came over from the design team and uh, we have the files here and you're gonna import them into this massive cutting machine that you guys have here. Yeah. And uh, so can you walk me through what actually goes in? So you just put a thumb drive in and spits out some codes and cuts me off a piece of metal or what? Uh, well, there's a simple <laughs> approach to it, yeah. But basically we just take the, the files from our, our cutting software. Yeah. Um, we can import it here directly from the USB drive. Okay. Then the operator will then set up the machine for, like for the tool path and everything, so exactly, it knows how to cut for the it specific up. cut. Um, and then we'll, we'll we'll cut the piece. You know, as you've you've seen, it's it's a very straightforward yeah. process, yeah. Uh, very efficient process. It's um, quite so fast as well, yeah. So, well, we we have a 12 kilowatt machine here. Um, you know, why we went for a 12 kilowatt is purely just efficiency. Okay. Um, you know, a lot of people in the market are using three or six kilowatt. Um, right. But for us, because we're cutting six meter sheets for our trailers set up, yeah. um, we require that length of cutting bed. Um, but again, the, the high kilowatt rating of the machine is purely just for efficiency for and us. You can cut quite thick uh, sheets as well. So, I mean, it's not only just for like trailer or like certain kitchen fit outs like no. mine, you can actually do some like bulletproofing thick metal, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Theoretically, we can cut hard ox um, okay. on the machine, um, but if we look at an MS standpoint, we can cut up to 35 millimeter. Wow. Um, we can cut up to 22 millimeter of um, stainless steel. Okay. And the same with aluminum. Aluminum, a lot of people don't like to cut because the reflection may damage the laser head. Oh, I see. But we're using fiber. Stainless laser. steel is not the same case with stainless? or It can be, but generally with your cutting with stainless steel, have the, the film on there yeah, to protect it. Um, so that obviously reduces the glare. Yeah. Okay. And what's the reason that you chose like a laser over something like a water jet or a plasma cutter that would be sufficient to do these type of cuttings? I mean, yeah. is, there, is there a benefit um, from a consumer perspective yeah. to, to go for you know, a company that has laser versus something else? I think for us, it was purely on a needs basis for our business case. Um, and when we look at the fiber laser, we're looking at the, the accuracy. Mm -hmm. um, so I think this machine running about 0.03 of repeat accuracy per millimeter. Um, so it's good for small parts that you need consistent. It, we, when consistent. we need, exactly, we're looking at small um, parts that we need that accuracy for and consistency more, yeah. more to the point. 
Um, when you look at the laser uh, water jet, sorry, the water jet machine is, is, does, serves its purpose, but it's more custom to higher thicknesses of material. Um, but then you also got to take into account the maintenance, the operating cost, and then yeah. the, the potential... The holes as well, yeah. Uh, exactly, yeah. So but basically for us, when we look at the fibre laser, it's what suited our requirement for our business model. Um, but as you can imagine, that we don't have enough capacity right. through our shop to utilise this machine. So we also offer this machine to the market as an outsourced service for cutting and bending. Okay, so you mentioned that you can cut um, MS or mild steel, stainless steel, aluminum. Is there any other like plastics or wood no, or? Nothing or? combustible that we can cut on this machine. Right. Um, we're talking about metals only. Okay. Um, we, we can cut copper, we can cut bronze. Okay. And we've never been asked to cut anything other than SS, MS and, and aluminum. Okay. Apparently those three are the main mainstays of the requirement. Nice, well I'm excited to get this started. I, I really want to see this start to come together. So let's get cutting, huh? Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> yeah, so the operator now is just um, setting up the machine with the parameters required for this uh, press brick job. So he'll be changing the specific tooling required. So we're using the press brick machine um, basically to have consistency in the, the, the folding process and to limit any work post bending in terms of the fabrication. It allows us to achieve more consistency in the, in the process. It's important to get consistent bending, especially along a longer piece of material, you know. Just checking that across the length to make sure there's no creep in the bend. Some machines you will have one or two degree difference from end to end, but this machine's compensating for that flex. So after he makes the bend, he checks to confirm that it was done to spec on the yeah, machine? Yeah, he's double checking that he's receiving the, the angle that he's achieved, trying to achieve. I mean, the machine is pre-programmed in any case in terms of the angle and the distance of what the angle should be started from. Ultimately, double checking that the machine has given them what he expects it to give. So what are the benefits of uh, doing it this way versus cutting pieces out? Minimal welds and obviously you're retaining more integrity in the piece. And more accuracy, more consistency. And it's a lot more efficient. And aesthetic. And aesthetically pleasing, exactly. I think also one point about press brake machines is that it's not just the machine that does the work. I mean, the operator needs to know how to get the best out of the machine. So here's a question. How do they know in which order to do the bend? So, so they're not put in the position where they can't bend that piece later. Experience. Is that just experience? or okay. Exactly, experience. So this guy's able to look at a piece of paper and see folds and then determine himself as to which order to do those folds? Yep. After we create this last fold, we will take the piece over to the fabrication shop to weld the seams and then conduct a test fit to ensure the part is meeting the exact specifications that we need. All right guys, we're over here in the fabrication side of the workshop now. They just brought the panels over from the folding team next door and they've started to assemble them and weld just the seams here on the corners to make sure that everything is nice and smooth and sanded down. Very minimal welding to be done on these panels, which is one of the benefits of having you know, a CNC and a laser cutter or a folding machine at your workshop. So they end up looking super nice. So from here, I think they're going to start powder coating some of the drawers and some of the face plates, do a test fit to make sure that everything, when it's assembled, fits properly without any gaps or tolerances. And then we will probably do final assembly and handover. So um, in addition, you can see my stainless steel water tank just behind me. The reasons why I went with the stainless steel water tank, you know, there's many different types of tanks on the market, whether it's PVC polyurethane tank, an aluminum tank, or a stainless steel uh, water tank like I have. You know, ultimately, whichever one you choose to go for is up to your use case scenarios. There's a bunch of different benefits and disadvantages to each type. So a PVC polyurethane or, you know, plastic tank generally are very affordable and they are quite light. However, they're not very customizable as to the shapes and size of them, as well as them being food grade is uh, a bit challenged with heat and things like that. They're a, a big breeding area for bacteria 
to form, so it's difficult to maintain them and keep them clean. They often will take on an odor and a taste to the water. Next up from there would be you know, an aluminum tank, which are great for general purpose. If you're looking for a tank that just wants to hold water for cleaning and washing and so on, they're a fantastic tank. They're generally uh, pretty affordable. They're a little bit more expensive than a PVC tank, but they're definitely not as expensive as a stainless steel tank. However, to make them food grade and to avoid the aluminum leaching into the water, we need to have a coating done on them, usually an epoxy coating. And uh, in order to get that coating through all the baffles and uh, cover the entire interior of the tank, likely we'll need to fill the entire tank. So for a 200 liter uh, tank, you need to fill you know, 200 liters of epoxy to make sure it gets to every nook and cranny. Uh, guaranteed to get every nook and cranny and then drain that tank um, and ensure that that epoxy cures and doesn't itself degrade and leach into the water and whatever cleaning and, and um, sanitizing solvents you use uh, need to make sure that that also doesn't break down the epoxy so for me I didn't want any chemicals or anything going into the tank I wanted just uh, a stainless steel tank because it is inherently uh, food grade if you use a higher grade of stainless steel. There isn't any treatment or anything that you need to do to the tank uh, in order to keep it food grade, you know, with the exception obviously of just ma regular maintenance and cleaning. So one of the important things though for me was that um, I found a shop that did the electrode brush cleaning or passivation. It's not necessary for food grade, but what's nice about doing passivation on a stainless steel uh, tank is that it cleans the weld line and uh, restores the chromoleum oxide layer on the weld. Um, basically preserving um, that weld and preventing any rust or anything to form. Even though that it's stainless steel, stainless steel, as we know, can rust. Uh, just look at you know your barbecue outside and you'll find that it's starting to pit stuff in some places. So to me, that was an important layer since I'm not painting this tank. Um, it's pretty well covered and protected. It's underneath my roller cover um, and behind a, a painted molly panel, so it should be pretty well protected. So I'm super excited to see uh, the drawer system come together and I can't wait uh, for the next step in the process. So the guys have been working super hard the past few days to make sure that this build is complete before my upcoming trip. They received all the panels and drawers back from the powder coater and they've done the installation in the back of the truck and now they're just making sure that all the water and electric and gas lines are installed properly and are not leaking and making sure all the drawers and all the fitment is aligned properly. So I know I didn't talk too much about the battery system because I'm going to save that for a whole nother video but basically I'm running a 200 amp hour lithium battery and I have a DC to DC charger, a Red Arc 40. Uh, that is charging that battery up as well as a 270 watt solar panel on the roof to help um, subsidize some of that charge. But as I mentioned, I'll go into that in more detail in another video. But for now, let's go ahead and check out what they've done. So moving from right to left, on the right side here, we have some 12 volt outlets. Uh, the top two are USB-C fast charging. The bottom two is one is USB slow charging and one is just standard 12 volt. And below that, there's a vent which uh, pushes air out from the battery. And above that, we have a really long storage for anything that is long, like uh, light poles. Um, at the moment, I just have recovery gear stuffed in there. And then obviously, we have my 75 liter Dometic fridge with the pull out. And then next to that, we have this full length storage box. And I've already started putting stuff inside of it. And they have these fantastic dividers which interlock. And the whole thing. It's super easy on slides with these custom handles. Obviously we have 200 liter or around 200, maybe a little bit more, 200 liters of water. Our gas hookups are on the left side and the water pump and filtration system is on the right. And then moving along, we have these storage boxes from the top. There's two of them on this side with just some compression latches and they just cover obviously full deep storage which right now I've just got some camping chairs and things like that in there. And then below that you have the switch panel which has all of the power outlets for the tent and the water pump and all the lighting auxiliaries and you can see the water level and the tank from here. And then obviously the main purpose of this whole drawer system is this full length kitchen with sink and stove which is fantastic. It has a storage on the top. You can remove this stainless steel cutting board. And inside is just super deep storage with pots and pans and cups and things like that. Over from there, we have a two burner Dometic stove as well as a full sink. And if you've noticed from any of the Instagram feeds already that the drain does not drain from underneath. 
it actually is hidden and follows all the way through to the center of the truck where the Super Duties have fifth wheel towing and it goes out from one of those drains there. And same with the electrics. The electrics don't go through any of the bulkheads. They all come through the fifth wheel towing points. So there's no cutting on the bed and it's super clean. There's also a pull out drawer here where you can put cutlery or any other kind of kitchenware, which I've already <laughs> stuffed full of stuff. So yeah. All right, guys, that's going to wrap it up for this video. If you feel like I left anything out, make sure you leave a comment down below and don't forget to like and subscribe the video. And uh, I want to say a special thank you for everybody here at the Valor Teams for making this possible. It really wouldn't be possible without you guys. Each and every one of the employees here has had something to do with this build. And the quality is just absolutely amazing. So uh, a really heartfelt thank you for everybody at the Valo team and Andrew for allowing me in to film as well. And uh, if, if anybody's interested in doing a similar build of your own, you can reach out to Valo at info at the rate valodesign.e. That's our email address. And you can also connect us on our uh, social media on Instagram. The link will be in the description. Thank yep. you. Take care. Thank you.